Now let us move on to your next panel for this afternoon with a topic of infrastructure planning in smart cities. And your panel outline would be role of FTTH in smart cities, pillars of smart cities, infrastructure-related requirements for establishing smart cities, and role of AI and blockchain in smart cities. Your panelists are Mr. Jihad Tayara, CEO of Evotech, Mr. Roland Montaigne, Business Development Director, Broadband and FTTX Principal Analyst, Ms. Fatima Mohamed Saleh, Vice President of Fixed Access Network at Tisalat, Mr. Yusuf Khalili, General Manager and Partner at XN, and Mr. Imad Kredi, Chairman and Director General of Gero Lebanon. Your moderator, Mr. Fadi Sidani, managing, managing partner of Governance Dynamics. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I was, would like to start first by thanking Tony for this, uh, uh, always inviting us to this great event. Um, and it's a privilege to be here. So thank you, Tony. So we have a distinguished panelist today. And what we try to do with regards to the topic, which is infrastructure planning and smart, in smart cities, is to take a higher level approach into considering what will be, not only what constitutes smart cities, but what are the enablers, the challenges, the stakeholders, as well as the key areas of success. Now, smart cities have been referred to in different names. So uh, they were referred to as digital cities, sustainable cities, and cities of the future. Um, people talk about, when we talk about smart cities, we're talking about you know, based on some research we have conducted, we talk about smart people, people who are better connected, smart environment, uh, we're talking about smart economy, smart governance, smart mobility overall, uh, smart living. So uh, with our distinguished panel, we're trying to explore these areas further. And um, we are not restricted by the pure infrastructure discussion on the FTTA, so we're gonna talk more about that. Uh, and I'm going to uh, follow an approach that is not necessarily in sequential order, if the panelists allow me. Um, but I would start with the, the, asking Mr. Khalili is, uh, what constitutes, from your experience, a, a smart city? What are their key attributes? Yeah, so ju you just mentioned the most common dimension. So a smart city really is a definition that stipulates that a city needs to harvest the benefits of the connectivity and IT, so ICT. Uh, and unlock the data from the various silo systems to deliver a certain benefit to the constituents of the city. And those benefits may vary, and the focus of the city may or may vary from the dimensions you mentioned, but eventually it's to enhance the quality of living, to deliver better efficiencies, and to ensure the safety and resilience of the city. So uh, if you think of the role of the data being unlocked from the various silos, and then something happens to this data to deliver those connected journeys or experiences, eventually to deliver a certain benefit. That's really what uh, defines a smart city. Okay, so, uh, so it, it appears to me, is with the way you define smart city, that it, is, that it has a standard definition that may apply to all cities, but is that correct? Is that true? I mean, I don't know. Do we have the same matrices for success for all smart cities? I don't know, Jihad, you want to comment? Yeah, uh, definitely not, definitely not. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me on the panel. Uh, definitely not. Every city, as Yusuf said, has its own set of uh, challenges, problems, and answering those ch challenges and solving those problems represents its smart city. So what's, uh, let me start by saying what smart city is not. It's not an application, and it's not about technology. Smart city is a set of orchestrated systems, platforms, enablers, services that will deliver uh, journeys in Abu Dhabi that will deliver use cases and happiness in Dubai, that will uh, deliver seamless transportation in Amsterdam, that will deliver different types of uh, benefits to residents of the city, uh, uh, to uh, uh, people who live, who experience the city. This is, uh, it's extremely important to move from uh, connected services, and now we're talk, we talk about infrastructure, we talk about fiber, we talk about how all the services and the uh, systems are connected. It's important to interconnect those services so that they talk to each other, as Yusuf said, to unlock the data, to avail the data between different departments and different services, and to provide a seamless experience to the people in the city. Okay. The, the notion of, you asked the question of there is a measurement or a common... Yeah. 
So unfortunately, that's not available today. Um, there are two initiatives from the ITU and from ISO towards this objective. Currently, all the benchmarks and the rankings of uh, smart cities is done by private uh, consulting firms and universities, um, which, is, which is cool as a start, but it doesn't provide in a very objective view and a very scientific view or a methodology towards um, uh, ranking. But really, that's good to have. But what really matters is a city to be true to itself and to its characteristics. So if I want to do a smart city to deliver um, effective transportation in Amsterdam, then I need to actually measure the KPIs of how much I deliver towards that KPI. And it's okay if I rank one or 10 globally on that dimension, but at least I've delivered what the taxpayer's money went to. And that's what really matters. But unfortunately today, this activity is not where it should be. Okay, so I think it seems to me that one fundamental part of success is connectivity. You know, I, I think that that's what a successful smart city would, would be. Regardless of what kind of metrics you're going to be using, connectivity is a critical success factor. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Kadi, I, I know you have emphasized the connectivity in your key projects in, in Lebanon. So what, were, what was the mindset when you started with that? I mean, um, basically, uh, again, I thank you for hosting me in uh, uh, this panel. Um, what we decided a couple of years ago in Lebanon is that connectivity and infrastructure was the basis for everything. And I don't think that we, um, uh, we are reinventing the wheel. Um, it is, we believe that this infrastructure, the availability of fiber connectivity in, an, in any country or in any city is key in order to move forward with a digital transformation. Uh, uh, we, we were able to, uh, since 2017, in comparison, 2019 to 2017, we grew the traffic by 300% and managed to raise revenue by 50% despite a drop in price by 50% in 2017. So basically, what we're witnessing is people are calling upon this connectivity and using it. And the most interesting part, until a month ago, uh, small, medium enterprises and corporates are using this infrastructure more and more in order to develop and to go forward with digital transformation. So this is the positive implication, uh, if you can say this, mm -hmm. of having a, an infrastructure that is available ready for the private sector. Okay, so basically providing the infrastructure for small it's and medium key. enterprises. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's relevant to all businesses, uh, yes. you know, uh, and also to the homes. But, uh, you know, I'm talking about the uh, small and medium enterprises, they, they build on this now because Absolutely. it facilitated a lot of uh, the delivery uh, mechanisms and made things a lot more efficient and uh, convenient. Actually, uh, it is a matter of fact, like the municipality of Beirut, uh, uh, got in touch with us in order to start implementing, rolling out, they want the help of Ogero in rolling out an IoT infrastructure so that they can start uh, using this technology in their uh, in their day-to-day -day operation. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Fadim, I, the question I have for you, I mean, Uti Salat has invested tons of money in the, in the infrastructure and uh, made it happen. I would like to know from your end, uh, what has been the challenges uh, that you have uh, experienced in, in, in driving this uh, connectivity through the infrastructure you have. Yeah, uh, I'd like to emphasize that uh, in continuation with uh, my colleague, what he has stated about the infrastructure, that the infrastructure, the FTTH infrastructure is the backbone and the main pillar for the smart city. So without having the fiber in the ground, it will be very hard to implement and to deploy. So uh, we are in UAE uh, having the highest percentage of the fiber optic cable worldwide. Uh, currently, we ranked uh, uh, number one in the global penetration for the last three years. We are having the city which is fully covered with fiber. The percentage is more than 95% currently. So uh, we don't have much challenges at this stage being having the fiber cable in the ground with enough capacity. So deploying the access technology over the passive infrastructure is very much easy and convenient. 
and can be done in a very fast and efficient manner. So the main challenge is to have the fiber in the ground. Uh, so I believe uh, for us, يعني, it is very much easy to deploy. But I think for the other countries, they should have, again, they should have a very strong program to deploy the fiber in the ground and to have enough capacity. Because it is different than the fiber which you require it for the enterprise or for the SMBs or for the normal tenancies and houses. The fiber architecture will be completely different. So it's needed, what's needed that to have the capacity should be enough in the ground and accordingly you can design as per the needed uh, architecture. So, uh, yeah, the infrastructure is, is very yeah. much critical for the success uh, and having the backbone, as you indicated. But funding comes to be a critical challenge at times for some countries. That challenge. I mean, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and I think may, I may refer to uh, our colleague uh, from Bunia who talked about mm -hmm. you know, the, the, all the investments that they are making in that, in that space to help drive better mm -hmm. infrastructure. Now, uh, now Mr. Roland, from, from your experience, um, and I know you were, your experience were more, more into Asia Pacific, uh, countries, how did this go ahead to, you know, how did you go ahead in, in, in terms of, what are the success stories, I guess I'm, I'm asking, in terms of implementing uh, the infrastructure and developing smart cities? Well, indeed, uh, at Ida Digi World, we have the privilege to look at FTTH rollout worldwide, but we did um, last year the first panorama of uh, what we call smart fiber uh, cities in Asia Pacific. Because as Mrs. Saleh was saying, we believe that fiber is really the, the cement uh, of the, the, the smart cities. But nevertheless, um, it depends also on the needs of each uh, city, as my colleagues were saying, it's totally different from one city to another uh, in Asia Pacific. Nevertheless, uh, we believe that fiber is really the cement because more and more uh, the city will need cloud-based uh, uh, services, we need short latency, and we need 5G also, and we know that uh, a fiber will be also need for the uh, mobile backhaul or, or 5G. Uh, we have uh, uh, classified different uh, ranking of cities in Asia Pacific, and what we call the, the champion city uh, in the zone, where Singapore, uh, uh, Tokyo, uh, um, and, and uh, uh, also um, um, Seoul. But the needs were very different. If I take the example of, of uh, Tokyo, for example, because of the aging population, uh, having help using uh, uh, robotics, uh, using AI is already uh, implemented in certain boroughs of, of Tokyo because uh, aging population is key uh, for Tokyo. If we look more what's happening in Seoul, it's very based on, on uh, education and uh, transportation. So, it is very different in terms of needs from one country to another, but again, the, the infrastructure and in particular fiber is key as an enabler. Okay, so basically you're saying that it has to have uh, some kind of uh, a problem or, uh, to address or uh, a view on, on issues that needs to be resolved before, before you start. I mean, the question is to Jihad, so what is the starting point? So you, you are in a country that I'm not talking about necessarily the UAE, you're talking about maybe an African country or some other country. And where is the starting point in, in uh, having a smart cities? Where do you start? Starting point, again, is looking at the challenge. You mentioned problem. I don't think it's not always a problem. It's the main challenge of that city. And it's not country by country. Different cities have different challenges, even within the same country. So you start at looking at the challenge. So for instance, in the UAE in general, uh, and specifically in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Sharjah, electricity consumption uh, increased uh, more than double in the past 10 years. Okay, so this yeah. is a major challenge, right? Uh, you have a population moving into the rural, into the, uh, the city, urban areas. Uh, by 2050, you'll have more than 91% of the population living in cities. That's another, that's adding to the challenge. So what do we do to this? Yes, you start by laying down the fiber, and uh, thanks to the Salat and Do and Jero uh, and Beirut, you, you set up that infrastructure. This is essential, but this is not sufficient. 
it's not sufficient to claim that I have the fastest broadband or the fastest internet to claim that I'm a smart city. You need to go beyond that. You need to start building platform. You need to start looking at identity services. You need to start looking at interconnecting all the uh, uh, services from uh, payment services, identity services, to be able to consume your services online. Going back to the challenge of the uh, electricity, the challenge of energy management, uh, we are working on, as I'll give you an example, so we're working with uh, our partner Johnson Control and Microsoft to deliver one of the smartest buildings in the region, which is the BIA headquarter. This will be, uh, so this will add, will tackle the efficiency of the building, it will tackle uh, the productivity of the employees, and it will create a wow effect. So we focused on that vertical in terms of smart city and <coughs> IoT services to deliver smart building services and to deliver uh, uh, use cases and journeys and experiences to employees, to visitors, to the management of the building that are really wow. So as an example, you'd be walking to the building and you'd be uh, uh, talking as to the building, interacting with the building and asking the building to uh, fix the, the comfort or the AC for you. The building senses your presence and knows how to you know, play with the temperature to save energy. It knows how to uh, 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 I mean the, the, the interact with the lighting. Yeah, yeah. And you can book meeting rooms, you can uh, uh, interact with your ERP system. And this is when we talk, when I was in the telco, it was always the discussion of communication and connecting departments. Now we're talking about connecting, when I'm advising enterprises, I want to connect even the department inside those enterprises, those entities. They need to talk to each other. Finance, ERP, HR, those systems are even being interconnected. And this is the next level of uh, uh, improving the smartness of the building or the experience. Okay, the, thank you. Khalili, Mr. Khalili, you want to come in? Mr. Khalili? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so challenge is, uh, is a good start, but uh, often now it's moving towards also the external view, so opportunities, capturing opportunities and being competitive. So while you want to fix all those things internally to deliver efficiencies, uh, better experiences, better quality of living, you actually want to use this to market your city because cities are now competing for resources and for talent. And uh, a, a recent example is the rise of the kingdom and the rise of Riyadh as a city compared to uh, Dubai or Abu Dhabi in terms of actually attracting regional talent within this industry and across the entertainment and so forth. So cities are competing and they're using the proposition of being smart to attract uh, talent. Also, uh, within the dimensions you mentioned, smart economy is a big focus area. So um, if you think of what does that actually drill down to, you find that attracting FDI is a big focus. Entrepreneurship and coming up with the next unicorn is a big focus. Uh, economic conditions and the ease of doing business is a big focus. So you want to become smart to actually deliver those things and become competitive and grow uh, the city, not necessarily only to deliver uh, on fixing challenges, which are absolutely important. But now, it's, I think the era is beyond, at least in the, in the countries we are here in the Gulf, the focus for becoming smart has been more around positioning the city as a competitive city rather than uh, really looking into addressing challenges. In, in smarter cities in where resources are scarce, yes, it has been, it has, the focus has been addressing challenges first. In, in this part of lavish world, if you wish, it's been around positioning and being different. Okay, so, you know, it, it, just referring to my experience in consulting projects, typically, you start from the top, right? You make sure that you have alignment with the leadership of, uh, of the corporation or the business. Now, if you're talking about a city or a country, you, wouldn't you necessarily want to have alignment with the leadership? I mean, UAE has been on the forefront of driving innovation. And so this is a statement they made some time back, and they have worked on it, and, and they have delivered on it. I mean, just in terms of putting the KPIs for success. Now. Now, not all the countries have the same privilege, you know, in, in terms of having such a forefront uh, advanced way of thinking. You know, uh, the question, I guess, to, to, to any of the panelists is that, how do you go about doing this if you don't have the support of the leadership? 
are not, not a clear, I mean, not a clear support of the leadership. Well, you don't know where they stand. Again, I mean, this differs again from city to city. And I, I, I know what Imad will answer <laughs> about his challenges. Okay, the challenges here are different. I'll focus again on challenge because to me, all opportunities are created when you fix channel, when you address challenges, when you address. So, so challenge tackling, yeah, of course, the tackling the the lack of resources. This is a challenge. When you fix it, you you tackle the opportunity itself. But if you look at uh, how how you, so we're we're lucky here in the UAE that we have the alignment from top. So we have a clear strategy. We have a clear mandate. But I I always. Um, uh, bundle alignment and mandate with inclusion. You cannot deliver a smart city if you have only the mandate from the top. It has to be an orchestrated uh, story. It ha you have to include everybody. You have to include all the department, you have to include all the services, all the systems, all uh, involved, a lot of technology in this. So it's really, I always call this, it's a, a, a mandate and inclusion of all the departments. I mean, I, I and think actually, right. the, the story of Lebanon is a little bit funny because for the past six years or seven years, seven ministries have been fighting in order to get the ownership of the digital transformation. Okay? Until today, we're not yet fixed who is responsible in order to drive this project forward. Despite all effort by the cabinet and the prime minister uh, in person, this, this issue is not solved yet. So at Uzer, we are taking things into our hands and initiating initiatives whereby we are leading you know, the way, at least by providing the technology, providing the platforms, the connectivity, as we, we, we said earlier, in order to enable um, some kind of a start for this digital transformation. Everything has been cast in stone in terms of studies, researches, um, plans, quote unquote, but nothing, there is no decision yet at the leadership level in order to kickstart the project seriously. This is one of the most important challenges Lebanon is facing today in the technology framework. Yeah, well, I, um, Fadi, if I may. Um, yes. There's a view that cities can only be smart if they're government. Uh, and we, we're seeing more adoption of smart city um, blueprints from developers. So when developers build a private city, or we call it a district, it's much easier actually to immediately deliver those solutions and get the city up and running. And we've seen it in multiple districts around the region. And our prediction is that um, the existence of those multiple mini cities and the fact that they're going to go much faster than government cities will actually put a pressure on the actual mother cities to become smart. And if you go around the world and see those success lighthouses, they are actually driving the capital, the local government, and then the central government to move um, uh, faster. The, the difference between such uh, projects and government cities, as we know them, is that you don't have things like education element or health, because these are confined cities that are focused more into the uh, uh, efficiencies and delivering the uh, better living and quality of living experience than uh, going into the very complicated uh, uh, full wheel view of the dimensions. But, but that's happening much faster. And then if you distill it down to the buildings that Jihad mentioned, then it becomes even faster and faster because we see a lot of demand now into making it real, like, yeah, delivering uh, you know, transportation within a district uh, with, with cool uh, the, you know, alternative uh, uh, hybrid or electric vehicles, that's excellent. But tell me about how you can touch my life at work, how you can touch my life at home. How can you make it real? Right. And these projects are what we're seeing that are actually going to drive the next growth. I think this is very important because uh, I think one of the challenges that I have we talked about, it's not a top-down approach only from, from government or the leadership down, but also it's a bottom-up approach. We have the millennials, you know, have, have certain expectations of life at large, and they, they, their KPIs of success are, are very different. You know, my question to you, Fatima, is, is that at, at Tisalat, how, how do you define, first of all, who are the, all the key stakeholders, and, you know, obviously, 
Um, and, and what are the uh, key performance? What are the key performance ind indicators from your end that you consider to be a success? Now, I, I don't, I don't know whether any city in the world or, or country can claim to be very mature in that space. But I would say some, some are more maturing than others. But in your area, how do you define? Who are the key stakeholders, and how do you define success? Yeah, um, what I'd like to highlight here that uh, again the government support for having the smart city nation is very much important. Because uh, by end of the day, we require like a platform to connect all the entities and government bodies under one platform. And by end of the day, sharing the data and information among these entities. That would be very much important. Uh, number two, as I highlighted earlier, again, having the fiber infrastructure in the ground. That making the transformation journey for either for the operator and even for the government uh, very much uh, easy and fast. So these two major components or pillars for having a successful smart, smart city. The government support as well as the infrastructure available in the ground. Okay. So, uh, good. Uh, well, thanks for that. Uh, now, in terms of industries, if we, if we try to relate smart cities to industry, whether education, healthcare, in terms of, if you will, citizen experience as a whole, uh, what, what has been the top priorities uh, that you find to be uh, overall, to be the top priorities? Is it uh, senior citizens? Is it uh, mobility? Is it the education sector? What has been? Well, uh, as been said, uh, uh, cities are, are competing uh, one to, to another, and this is the case in many parts of, 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 of the world. So, uh, uh, me, I, I really think that uh, even for industries, uh, if you don't have a central coordination, uh, it will be, there will be a risk of disequilibrium uh, in, in one city. So, that's why I, I think for the common services that are education, transportation, health, uh, the, the role of, of central uh, uh, metropolitan government or central government is key uh, for this, especially uh, for designing these platforms that are necessary to have the different services uh, to, to speak. And this is the case also for industry. What the industry wants, they want to have skilled people, they, have, they want to, to have uh, uh, also people not uh, tired in transportation. So this, this is key also for the success of one city. Okay, there is a, you know, some discussion that perhaps education should be at the front forefront of all, for all cities. And the, the driver is that people who are well educated are better able to drive everything else up. You know, how true is the statement, Mr. Ayman? It is very, it's very accurate, actually. It's a matter of fact that you, you, you know, you need this, this, um, uh, this class or, or, or this capability or skills in order to bring it up. Okay. Uh, without it, you, you, will, you, will, you will face challenges uh, uh, in, in, in operating this uh, uh, shift between normal cities into smart cities. Uh, it's an absolute necessity, obviously. And um, uh, again, in the particular case of Lebanon, uh, unfortunately, we are seeing this, this skilled people moving outside the country and leaving, leaving the platform very... Uh, 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 empty in, in terms of uh, uh, capabilities of operating this transformation. Well, that's but, very, very unfortunate, but I think things are hopefully uh, will be changing very soon to the point. I hope. I'm, 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 but, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to reflect a, a dark, uh, uh, dark image of what is happening in the country, but uh, uh, actually that's, that's what we're facing today. Hopefully things will get better. Okay. So, had, yeah, sorry, beyond education, anything that touches people's lives is important. Anything that improves and you know, enhances the way we interact with the city, with the community, with the building, with the, even the smart home, you know, if you, if you go at it from a city to district to building to home, anything that improves that is a priority and is important. Okay, so, it's, it's a, so as an example, we're working now with Sharjah City Municipality on implementing smart parking solutions. Okay? This is extremely important in Sharjah. Sharjah is a very congested city in terms of traffic, in terms of we're working on fleet management solution with the municipality to manage their fleet, to divert their fleet using uh, AI 
to uh, uh, provide you with available parking solution, estimated uh, arrival time in terms of fleet management. So it's very important again and again to touch on the uh, useful, not the, uh, be excited about it, about the challenges in the city, which are opportunities in the reality. But, but you can't a great possibly... opportunity to improve people's life. So, I mean, you, so, so one way to look at it is just say, we'll provide the infrastructure, make it work, okay, and let the free economy determine the priorities that they have, right? So I, but, on, one, on the other hand, you just say, okay, we, we, this is, are the priorities for us as a city, whether it's traffic or it's security, whether it's education or healthcare, you know? I, I find it to be very challenging for any government to tackle everything at the same time. Uh, they need to have some kind of prioritization. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, absolutely. I mean, actually, it, the, this, the, the whole exercise needs to serve a purpose. I mean, it's not about competing among, between cities who's first and who's second and who's, who's yeah. tenth. It has to serve the purpose for the constituent of a city. Uh, basically, as, as you said, it's impossible to tackle everything, but you need to organize and to set in stone your priorities uh, based on uh, uh, socio-economical facts that are, will limit your, your scope of action. Yes. So prioritization is a key in, in, in this project. So what's relevant for us in this particular city is what's important. It's not what's happening in San Francisco Absolutely. or Barcelona. Absolutely. But I want to ask you a question. Is, that, is there some kind of a maturity scale, model, metric, standard that would allow a city to measure how successful it is or being successful? Yes. So there is, uh, there is one. I'm, I'm going to talk about it in a second. But your question around education is uh, key. What, um, one of the challenges we face in this part of the world is the role of academia in driving innovation and adoption and uh, uh, into, into the smart cities. So uh, you would find most of the districts today, smart districts and smart cities are built uh, around uh, big research centers that stems from academia. And uh, the, the obvious challenge we have in the Gulf region, but even at a larger scale in the Middle East region, is that we import talent rather than we nurture talent uh, locally with the exception of some cities. And today, if you look at uh, uh, an ambitious project in Sharjah, for instance, towards having a smart district near uh, a university, um, is, is interesting because you, you want to actually leverage that education. One of the biggest challenges also that academia has beyond uh, this is having uh, old curriculum. So the curriculums are not teaching students, again with the exception with few universities in this wonderful country, curricula is old. And uh, if you continue to teach the same thing, you're not going to have the right, uh, yeah. the right outcome, outcomes. Uh, now back to the maturity. Um, as I said, the, the new ISO standard being now drafted looks, and we are fortunate to be sitting on that uh, technical committee that drafts it and reviews some of the maturity model we've, uh, we've drafted as, as a company. Uh, we're sitting on behalf of the UAE uh, seat uh, nominated by Smart Dubai. Uh, is, is interesting because it looks at four areas of customer experience. Uh, so basically front end, if you wish, a unified experience. It looks at data. Yep. And uh, uh, it looks at uh, the fact that uh, applications are connected. So there is, yeah. there is, there is uh, this underlying connectivity. And it looks at resilience and security of, of the cyber element. And this is very important to keep that balance, because if you don't, uh, the city cannot really achieve where it goes. How soon this standard will see the light? And it's a maturity uh, in motion standard rather than a fixed view into like a snapshot of where you are today. It actually tracks where, uh, where you're heading. Once that is out, I think we can all come around the same table and say, OK, so that's a very good candid ranking. And uh, from there, you can take measurable steps towards advancing in one area or another. Um, so uh, I, I haven't, uh, you, if you noticed, none of us used any uh, customer success stories like Jihad, because we don't have active projects in smart cities only. Please do, take. please do. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but I want to actually uh, uh, say that 
what, what I, I love about companies like us is to uh, do one at Salat and, and Jero and that. This is, we, we touch customers, right? So we, we actually take it from a blueprint of nowhere, current state, towards a good measurable uh, impact. Big technology companies have their own way of addressing smart cities, but they, it's either our way or nothing. Yeah. And, and if you look at, uh, and this is an aspect I want to mention, local, the role of local players within that transformation of a smart city is very, very important because we as companies around this table understand the culture. We come from this region and we take those best uh, technologies, try to couple it with the educational uh, element and then deliver that uh, value. You, you touched on the, when you, on the, when you, on the ISO matter on security and resiliency. And uh, this is a necessary evil, you know, as we become more digital. You know, data becomes more available, needs to be secured, you know, how, we, how do you maintain the balance? And the question is, uh, for Fatima, is that how does, how do you balance that? How, you know, uh, between the accessibility of data, making things available, making things smart, and at the same time, sec secure? Uh, and has this been a challenge uh, to, uh, to you? Yeah, uh, that what I stated earlier, that uh, the government role will be very much important in this area. Because by end of the day, the common data, uh, it should be under one platform. So all the entities and the government, uh, uh, let's say government uh, uh, companies should use that particular data. The data should be shared among all the entities. So uh, that's needed a lot of work, actually. And it's required that these institutes to be linked with each other. Uh, and it's required like a system platform which will share the data among all these entities. And by end of the day, the gov government should uh, deploy a policy and rules to maintain the accuracy and the sharing of such data among everybody. Okay, so uh, so what I hear you saying is it, it has to be more the responsibility of government for the security of, of the of yeah. the data. Yes. Uh, and and but also it, it it requires that the corporates have their own security systems and, and to to secure the data as well. Would you agree, Mr. It should be from Andy? both ends, actually. Pardon? From both parts. From both parts. Yeah, yeah. Because actually, um, um, you know, uh, data security is considered now a, a sovereign matter. You know, it's not it's a national matter. It's not about a corporate matter. It's, an, it's a national matter for a lot of, of entities, particularly those entities that are government, like ministries mm -hmm. and municipalities and what have you. There was a discussion at NATO uh, just two weeks ago around whether um, a cyber attack constitutes an act of war and it warrants a response with normal weapons mm -hmm. yeah. so it is becoming yeah. really definitely something that uh, is paralyzing cities ransomware is rising is on the rise uh, for governments many cities and many uh, 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 nations have paid a lot of money to retrieve back their data um, and uh, IP secrets are being stolen from corporates so, and then the security of the individual at home for the privacy and the security of their data is questioned. Uh, this is the next game. I was this morning at a lecture uh, around quantum, quantum computing and quantum computers uh, being able today uh, to, uh, to break with just 10 qubits to break into the uh, biggest uh, crypto uh, algorithms available. And uh, this is scary because unless you use quantum uh, uh, yep. uh, algorithms, you can't fight it. And this is today. And it's, it's technology available. You can rent it uh, on the cloud, play a little bit with it, and go wherever you want with it. So you're talking about a national grid, a power grid, water grid. You're talking about dams. We all remember the Estonian attack in 2007 where the whole power grid went down and uh, recent uh, attacks in the US. And so this is uh, the resilience, city resilience as a concept and the privacy of, uh, and protection of data. 
and threat detection uh, is the name of the game. And it's an important element as we continue to gather the data in one platform, mm -hmm. there's an advantage and disadvantage mm -hmm. because you bring the whole resources in one place, which is good because you want to build those connected uh, uh, experiences. But at the same time, you actually uh, put uh, a big risk on, 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 on the city. So, th so this is a very critical matter. It's a necessary evil. Uh, when, you, when you have that, how, how did you deal with this in Lebanon? I mean, actually, we're taking this very seriously. Uh, since uh, Ojero is the custodian of the gates, I'm, we're working very closely with the security agencies, the private sector, in order to, to have this concept of a protection of complete grid. Uh, um, we are at the very beginning of those efforts. Again, uh, the whole exercise is under the umbrella of the uh, uh, Prime Minister's uh, office, whereby a complete strategy, cybersecurity strategy, and a protection scheme and standards are be being put in place. Okay. We're taking it really seriously. Okay, uh, we are, we are out of time, but I have one more question, Mr. Khalili. Just this ISO standard. Uh, if a, if a city want to run run it on a uh, on its draft, it's a draft, right? Yeah. You know, is that a possibility or that would not a work? A possibility to see the light? You mean? No, no, no. Possibility to, to implement it. It's written. It's drafted, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, so City X wants to see to apply it to its own. Yeah, so you do uh, quick assessments uh, against this standard, just like any ISO standard. Right. You will have the normal assessors accredited as ISO assessors to go and assess a city and uh, deliver a quick assessment. So there will be a light assessment and a long assessment, and a city can actually follow follow measurements in the four quadrant I mentioned to go from point A to point B over time. That will really make things more scientific. I know there was a, an earlier uh, effort from the ITU. I, don't, I haven't followed up where that reached. But both of them, the ITU one takes it from the telecom connectivity more angle. The ISO one takes it uh, from the experience and data more. But both will probably deliver something really together unique in terms of finally having uh, an unbiased view that can be assessed by anybody in the market towards where are we with our smartness. Okay, well, thank you very much. I mean, the, the session is over. Do we have any questions from the floor? Tony, any questions? No questions? Tony. I think so. <laughs> Tony, we're, we're beyond time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, pronouncing beyond the region is the exactly <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, we talk in the morning about the infrastructure of some kind of fiber deployment, all this. Okay, but what we if we have a key solution, okay, which technology you it will domain the smart infrastructures? That's really a, I'm sorry if you, if you allow me, it's 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 really a, it, it depends on which layer of the technology, so yeah. you cannot rule out, say, I don't want to deploy fiber because I have 5G, right? You still need fiber. You cannot say I'll use NB-IoT and not use 5G. Uh, you cannot rule out Wi-Fi 6 now that it's coming and all this connectivity. So a lot of technologies, connectivity technologies are competing. A lot of uh, supporting and enabling technologies are competing. But the choice and utilization of technology should be really relevant to your use case. I'll give you an example. A friend of mine is the CIO of uh, one of the Verizon companies in the US. And when he assumed his job, the CFO had, had called for an implementation of a blockchain solution to manage the financial uh, system. Absolutely. It's an internal system. And that was, I mean, it's, it's, it's totally unnecessary. It's a great technology. It was the big hype of the blockchain, which is still, I mean, still there and still needed. But do you really need a blockchain solution to manage your internet, get a database and manage it. It's an expensive solution. It's an unnecessary delay to the service you're providing. And, uh, you know, it, it, and it's uh, prone to risk and failures in implementation. So do what you do best and focus. So the answer is there is no universal technology or solution for those. Uh, there, is, there, are, there is the economics behind it. Uh, for instance, uh, there is no point for, uh, for us, there was no point in Lebanon to deploy in the, in the mountain area fiber because it would become extremely expensive. 
we opted for a WTTX technology in order yeah, to ensure this connectivity. Just about the connectivity, I'm talking about smart uh, about everything. What is the complete solution? And he said there is no universal. Yeah. Okay, thank you very That's much. That's my view. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You <laughs> might have a different view. But <laughs> thank, no, you. No. thank you. <laughs> Always with you. We're aligned. Okay. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> and it's all about challenges. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other networking. questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> There's a question right there. Please. Uh, thank you so much. Now, we, the, regarding the data protection, uh, the discussion of data protection, as we know that the European Union, they came with the GDPR, the General Data Protection Re Regulations. Now, in the MENA region, we didn't see a such uh, a regulation, our regulation that, for the whole MENA region. And um, each country, they came with their, with their own regulations or regulations, which is not it's varied from one country to other country. Now today with the 5G, the data is, it will be within the country and cross-border. And that's, from two aspects, we believe it's very risky. Number one, the GDPR is a very stringent regulation, can affect us uh, if anything, if any non-compliance. Second thing, we don't have our own, as in this region, to make sure that those data are protected and, and definitely the customer data, and as you mentioned, the risk that's it's happening today. So from, the, from, from your perspective, what's the future in that area? Are we going to have really a unique uh, legalization or regulation similar to the GDPR? That's very important. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I can take this one. So uh, GDPR is a great, uh, great one uh, for, uh, for Europe. I'll give an example locally here uh, of, uh, of a good practice that Dubai government took, which is the Dubai data law. For instance, uh, this, if you look at the Dubai data law, which is one of its kind, not many countries in the world or cities in the world went all the way to issuing a law. You know, a law is very stringent, so you cannot change a law. Uh, and the law was issued with multiple dynamic bylaws, five of them. One of them was about the privacy. Of, uh, of data, which uh, we, we, uh, which we felt uh, uh, as, as, as a company living uh, and working in Dubai and as, a, as somebody who's been living in this wonderful city for uh, many, many years, it's, it's actually quite assuring to have a city uh, in this part of the world, which is not known uh, to, be quite, to be quite open around privacy, to take a stab at uh, data privacy and be clear around publishing privacy of data for corporates and citizens. So you can, you can go to the Dubai data law at dubaidata.ae and go to the Dubai law and look at the Dubai data manual, uh, standards, guidelines, and all the way to the five bylaws, which is one of them is IP protection, one of them is um, uh, use and reuse of data, and, and one of them is a technical standard and so forth. So that's, that was a good example. And now many cities are following steps and in the, in the kingdom, in Kuwait, uh, a lot of those are, are becoming a reality. Abu Dhabi is in, this, is, is in the middle of, of doing their own uh, data standards and data management uh, governance. Data governance in the new era, given the AI and given all the stuff that's happening to our data, facial recognition, you know, some people are refusing to be scanned as they go to the office. Um, it's, it's a big question. Is it your right to refuse to be scanned as you go to, into a building or into the tram or not? Or can the city enforce this upon you? And stuff like that. Uh, that's going to be the interesting discussion in the next decade because as we digitize more and more, I think there will be a, a, a real uh, rebellious movement towards this digital movement and you want to go back unless you ensure that your, uh, your rights are, are uh, protected. But I'd advise you to look at the work done in, um, in, in Dubai. So beyond the, beyond the regulations, just to conclude, I think which is very important, GDPR is one of them. Uh, I think what, what I know that there are many, many regulations are in the making, but nevertheless, this doesn't release the, any corporate from its own responsibility to have its own security code, if you will. To, to manage its own data security and the security, basically its own, I mean, not only the corporate, but also its employees and, and their stakeholders like vendors and uh, uh, other clients. Okay, uh, I thank you all for, for your, oh, do we have more question? Right there. Uh, yeah, I hope, uh, but we have one last question because we're way out of town. 
thank you very much for your speech. Actually, my question related to infrastructure planning. Uh, do you think it will be uh, يعني put more pressure on all operator to share the infrastructure because uh, we are talking about sensor and fiber will touch each and every place compared to the traditional network and uh, do you think uh, regulatory authorities need also to take a role similar to their control on the spectrum to, so now they will take a control on connectivity in last mile as well to, to push toward more uh, network sharing or it will be Case by case. Thank you very much. Uh, I think perhaps we can we leave this question to the next panel because I think the next panel will be better able to address this. Mm -hmm. If yeah. I, I think that's yeah. a good idea. The next panel is about the next panel. Will be, planning. Yeah, will be, it will be very relevant. And for the talk. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Tony.